All right, welcome back. Another week. We're late on this one. Actually, we we missed out last week. Uh, Dave and Luke were in Ohio, and we were awaiting their return uh, to get another podcast out. But here we are, and we got everybody here tonight, which is the first time in a little while. Yeah, we're uh, we were earlier talking about uh, the renovations of this room. We're going to change things up for everybody. And uh, maybe do a couple of these filmed. Yeah, throw them on our YouTube channel. Throw them on the YouTube channel. So if anybody uh, listening um, wants to, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, we haven't really pushed any of that stuff out that great. Um, YouTube's doing pretty well, but um, yeah, go check us out on the other platforms. And as always, my name's Sean Mandelier, Dave Crossman, and Luke Wheeler. Uh, we are game seekers. So tonight we are going to be talking. We've been trying to keep it to a sp- specific topic. And tonight we thought it would be very fitting to talk about hunting the rut. So uh, you guys just got back from Ohio. So why don't you guys kind of kick it off? What uh, What is it like hunting the whitetail rut in Ohio? Oh, uh, it's pretty crazy. This is everywhere, though. We yeah, can no, say it it's, it's well. It, yes, uh, yeah, right. Uh, it is. I mean, Vermont. I mean, listen, look. This is what all the politicians, the politicians say. They they say look yeah, before they <laughs> explain what they're about to say. Look, look. But that now you have to make no sense. Exactly. <laughs> Which I, I can do that too. <laughs> but no, um, Bull, bullshit for the next. Right. It, yeah. Potato. Uh, Bunk bed, deer, <laughs> uh, monkey wrench. That's all you need to know. Uh, yeah, no, but seriously. Um, so, we, you know, we've talked a lot about on this podcast about our roots growing up in Vermont and hunting deer and, and whatnot. And it wasn't really until, you know, we started going to the Midwest, mostly, you know, public land and whatnot, when we started actually seeing deer and, and what they actually do during the rut. Um, and Sean famously says he hates hunting the rut. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's, and a lot of guys that, that do this or do go to the Midwest or are big deer hunting, um, kind of gurus, I guess that, that kind of live for this, you know, would probably agree with them too. But Ohio, you know, Ohio is just such a different animal compared to what we grew up with. There's so many deer, um, and uh, I mean, we, so this farm that I, that I was able to lease this year, that's going to be part of Game Seekers now, uh, it's, uh, it's about 400 acres and it's a lot of, uh, you know, beans and corn, which this year, um, as some people that are listening to this probably know, it was super dry in the Midwest. By the time we had got down there. Really dry here actually too. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. It was really dry here. I know food plotting wise here i got rain i hit it right like when me and luke did that uh video that little short video of our food plot i don't even think we put that one out there but when we did that it rained but then it didn't rain again yeah after we seeded that was july 31st maybe yeah yeah so the all around the board yeah yeah, and down there it was especially dry this year and there was a lot of not so much thankfully where I lease that farm, but, uh, surrounding to the South, uh, there was quite a bit of EHD recorded this year. And, um, but we were lucky. We didn't find any of that kind of activity. We actually saw a, we saw a ton of deer and not, none of them seemed to be compromised from, from any of that. But getting back to what I said, it was, it was real dry. So this is a 400 acre farm. There's, um, corn and soybeans and alfalfa it's actually a working dairy farm slash giant uh grain business um because it was so dry this year when we went down all the corn had been cut which in past experience i've had usually first second week of november is when they start shelling corn which can really affect you know deer movement because they like to hide in the corn it's no secret you start cutting it, they come running out, and especially during the rut, you know, crazy. You can see some pretty crazy stuff. 
so the farmer farmers are great guys we we had a pretty good chat with them and and i asked them i said you know it seems like it's been real dry i said it seems early for you to have all your crops cut he said yeah he said usually we're starting right now and that was up you know november 5th or whatever when we got down there he said usually we're starting right now we've been done for two and a half weeks he said and with the amount of land they had around there i mean it probably took them a month or two to to harvest or you know probably a month to harvest whatever if no one's ever ventured out there um just and i mean it's kind of hard to explain but like just try to envision standing on a beach at the ocean Mm. looking out across some of these fields or they're just massive yeah you're talking i mean and and you go to kansas and and places like that or even iowa they're way bigger cornfields but for where we are there i mean they had plenty of 100 150 acre corn pieces and soybean fields you know so, uh, the crops were cut. We got down there. We had never stepped foot on the farm. Luke had got there a couple of days before I did, and he he had seen some chasing going on himself, some smaller bucks. So that got me excited. And he's he's Luke's looking around, and and he's like, "Man, is this part of your farm? Like, is this on your farm?" And I'm looking on on X, like, "Yeah, it looks like it." And then he found a tree stand. And he's like, "Is this part of it?" I'm like. It kind of looks like that's on my, my farm. Turns out it wasn't. Um, but so Luke got a little bit of a look at it. We got down there and we kind of just ramboed it out through there. You know, there was a few, there was a few spots on the farm where, um, we knew that we really probably shouldn't be going into, uh, because we jumped deer walking near it, you know, just getting out to put cameras up and stuff. But I think the rut was pretty much in full swing at that point. And when I mean full swing, I mean probably peaking. And, and that's not a great time to try to kill big boys as far as I'm concerned. Um, I mean, what do you think as far as timing wise? I mean, it, yeah, no, it, I like Dave kind of hinted toward this. I almost, I, I don't really get excited about the rut anymore. I used to, especially when I first started making trips to kentucky um illinois you know i was excited and that's why i wanted to go out with a ball right that's what you were chasing you know you heard all these stories when you were a kid so you like you pick up and go out there because of this like magical time of year which don't get me wrong it is it is and i i will say it's like the time to be in the woods. There's everything about the rut that everybody, you know, um, speaks on is, is true and got to be out there at all hours, but that's, that's why. Yeah. Right. That the unpredictability of whitetail movement is why now after 10 years of hunting out there, I, I'm starting to like, this isn't that great. I mean, any, anything can happen. At yes. Any anything can happen. Day, Trust me. Is... I, I've had some magical moments, mm-hmm. you know, Louie and I doubling up on the eight pointers one morning on the last set of a two week. Last time the three of us went to Illinois, yeah, we last shot time back to back eight pointers. And you, I mean, back, then to, back you sh- to back, back to back to back. We shot three eight pointers in a 12 hour window. Six, yeah, 12, 16 hours. Right, so yeah. d- don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying I hate the rut. I'm not, I, I'm saying is for a whitetail hunter to set hours on end, which I don't care if you're in Illinois. Ohio, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, I don't care where you are. You don't get caught up in the highlight reels from all this social media, right? You're going to have to spend time in a tree and there's multiple days. I'm sure you you had some sits that you were like, I might not see anything this set. Yeah. Right. But you're also putting in sometimes, you know, when the deer movement's really good, you might put it all day in one spot in a tree. You know, you start to dread that as a hunter a little bit. Yeah. That's a long day, man. It wears you out. So long. And I think why I kind of, you know, have changed my outlook on the rut or excitement for the rut is like, this is how I go into the rut. Like when I start taking these little vacations, I kind of going out there and it's like, it's not one of those like crank the radio up and get in your truck and drive for 15 hours just excited to pump the whole way anymore it's almost like as i'm packing my stuff to go out on this trip it's like here we go again you know it's gonna be 
you know, week and a half away from home. You know, I'm not going to be with my family. You know, look at me. I like, it's a lot of work. Like, it's, you know, now I got to. Did I pick the right dates? Did like... I pick the Is the weather going <laughs> to cooperate? Yeah. You know, what is the corn going to be standing when I'm out there? I'm not, you're not scout. You haven't scouted this area all summer long when you go on a, a rutcation, mm-hmm. right? You, you haven't, you don't know what's going on locally. So you get down to some of your spots that were dynamite last year and they're standing corn and you're just like, damn, yeah. I just drove this all this way and this corn standing. And now this week's going to be a long ass week because they're using it for cover, yeah. you know? So I think. I think for me, the whitetail rut has started, you know, I I go into it like you have to have a a strong, you know, mentally strong, um, patient personality to tackle the rut every year. Yeah. And I I think, think I think it's probably, it's the unknown too, because you could still, you know, get lucky and, and. Oh yeah, no doubt. It's a big boy cruising. I mean, that's one of the things like, you know, social media, obviously we use it, we're on it. You know, check us out, Game Seekers, everything. But uh, we're down there in our cabin, which is also a funny story. I don't know if we'll get, get into the cabin there. But, you know, we're sitting there at night scrolling through Facebook, and we're working on our, our uh, content and stuff. And people are shooting big bucks. I mean, they're shooting good ones, you know. And it's like Luke and I are uh, – we're seeing deer. We're seeing a lot of deer. We're having a lot of fun. Uh, we're just seeing small deer, you know, stuff that yeah. – Stuff, you know, year and a half old bucks that are chasing does around and to me and all that. And it can be so misleading, right? Because, um, like you said, we're all social media guys here and you know, that, you, that social media doesn't bother me anymore. It really doesn't bother me. I don't let it bother me, but it used to a little bit when you, when you do go out on this vacation, I can remember some of my first trips to Kentucky. Mm-hmm. I made this trip. It's supposed to be good because mm-hmm. I was told it was going to be good. Anything west of New York is going to be far better than anything a Vermont boy has ever experienced in his life. So, you know, with that kind of build up, right, is anything less would be disappointing. Well, then you get down there and it's 78 degrees. Right. And you're sitting over a, a bean field that the state put in and they put that in for a fire break because it's a different world. And so you have a forage bean field or some sort of competing crop where you can't get into and hunt and it's pulling all, yeah, they got more deer, but what good is all those deer if they're not where you can hunt them? Right. Nothing. So it's like, then you get on social media when you get back to the crappy hotel room and you look and it's 10 more booners have hit the ground because it's November. Yep. Right. So like, then you play that game in your mind, like everybody's shooting these deer, but it's such a misleading thing because everyone hunts this time of year Mm -hmm. because social media tells you, or even just grandpa tells you that these are the dates you got to be in the woods. So everyone, if, if everyone has a tag still, then everyone's in the woods these date. If more guys are in the woods, more guys are going to kill deer most more posts are going to go up. You see more posts. You think you're the last deer hunter in America to kill their deer. And you just logged three full day sets. Yeah. And and like the way I look at it too is, you know, so we, we're going to have a video coming up probably either tonight or tomorrow of our trip down there. And it's, we, we titled that we, we didn't kill anything, you know? So, and there's the re- there's a reason behind that, obviously. But you know, we title it a, a big buck scouting mission. You know, you can check it out on our Game Seekers YouTube uh, channel. But Luke's actually sitting in here working on it right yeah, now. He's he's tapping the keys over here. Well, I had it done, but then you want one little change because you didn't watch it all day because you had to work for a living. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's the other problem with the now rotation. I'm waiting for it to render, and then it'll take half an hour to upload. Then we'll watch it so, again and see something else. And I'll be yeah. late to. <laughs> Your camp. Never yeah, so let's back up because we we really just like dove into the empty pool on the roll rut thing. Yeah. But let's back up a little bit. Tonight is rifle season eve in Vermont. Um, so it's November fifteenth right now. So calendar says November fifteenth, right? Luke. Yep. Luke's looking at me like maybe yep. not. No, yeah, it's it November is. 15th. No, it is. Yeah. Yeah, because it starts the sixteenth. Yep. So calendar is going by what it felt like outside. It's more like October. Yeah, right. Seriously. So, uh, I mean, no, we haven't had a stitch of precipitation really in the last few days. 
right? It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. But anyways, deer, deer season in Vermont, I'm actually like, this is like deer season Eve. So I'm actually like a little excited and it's the craziest thing to me, right? Because I've been hunting since September, like the first Saturday in September. I've been, it seems like this hunting season has been, you know, three months already, even it's been two and a half. So I'm like, it feels just like a long time, but something about Vermont, I, and I think now for me, it's more seeing everyone get excited. I mean, the guys at work, there's going to be like half the guys have got vacation next week. You know, guys are starting to like, I just heard my neighbor shooting his rifle. You know, it's almost like Christmas. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That feeling that, I mean, I don't think they get that anywhere else, but here. I yeah. mean, do, do people on October 1st in Illinois start putting together their little, uh, I, I was seeing the post, uh, uh, Ron, uh, Ron, Ronnie Wood from the garage. Yeah. He's at deer camp. So oh, he yeah. does a picture of deer camp and it's just like, it's Ryan's in the background. He's got his, like his pack. Right. So he's getting his pack ready and it's there. They're it, literally going to walk like a hundred yards out behind the thing. <laughs> but their stand. you know, the excitement. Oh yeah. No, yeah. you know, so it's like, you're getting your stuff together. You're getting your clothes out. It's like, yeah. it is. So it is, I think I get more excited when I, when other guys are getting excited, but at the same time, it's like, I'm probably going to sleep in. Yeah. Yeah. I'm probably not even going to go out until the evening tomorrow. Luke's going to deer camp tonight. That's why he's trying to get out of here so quick. Well, I'm trying to, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's going to be asleep by the time I get there. But you've been hunting for a month. This, is this the first time I've, that happened? I've technically probably only hunted four days. Yep. With You're, a with a weapon. But with a camera. With a camera, I've seen a ton of cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. Now, the guys at camp, how many of those guys have been hunting up to this point? Two. Including Jared, you? Jared, no, Jared and Jake. My brother and my friend Jaron. Yeah. Uh Walker Mountain Game Call. Calls. Pro Staffer. Pro yeah. Staffer. They're the only ones that both hunt out of camp other than me. Yeah. So for a lot of these guys, it's my brother Jake actually already got a really nice six pointer. And then with it that was with a muzzle loader in New Hampshire. And missed another really nice one with his bow because he hit a tree. Mm. That that arrow is probably just gonna be there forever now. In Vermont? New, New Hampshire. Hampshire. New Hampshire. Yeah. How many can you kill in New Hampshire? I think you can kill one with a gun. And one gun three, is muzzleloader yeah. or rifle. Or rifle. And you can go one with your bow. No kidding. It's like Vermont used to be. Yep. Where they did the one buck thing. Yep. So how many guys in camp this is their first time out this year hunting? Well, down there probably four. But there's six or seven pe people that'll filter in and out i think so it's getting a lot smaller because the older guys are are moving on so yeah that's why you need young boy i gotta get down there yeah 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 no joke well we'll try to get you out of here pretty quick but actually that brings up like 45 percent. right i'm actually looking at it right now 45 percent of all of vermont's deer harvest which was 16,845 total harvest a forty-five percent of that was firearm season. Mm -hmm. So in sixteen days in Vermont, these next sixteen days of rifle season, almost. So you're looking at stats over there. Yep. Look up percentage of hunters that actually succeed in harvesting a point two one. That's what I mean. So you're going. You're, you're talking about what uh, is it? You were talking about point two one. Point two one percent. Point two one uh, deer harvested. Oh, that point two one. Deer harvested per hunter, so a twenty-one percent success rate. Yeah, so you're you're talking about all these people posting everything. Oh, everybody's getting a deer. No, less than twenty-one. Less than a quarter no, of but, hunters get yeah, but deer. Think about this. But that that's what I'm. How thinking many? About. If everybody posted their deer to social media, which they don't do, and you're not friends with all of them, but that would be sixteen thousand eight hundred and forty-five Facebook posts. <laughs> yeah, that looks but, like everybody yeah. in America but is it getting. Still, deer. would only be twenty percent of hunters. Yes, twenty one percent of successful are, are yeah. Successful. No, that's that's a so crazy there's stat. Seven, there's seventy eight thousand five hundred and eleven. So hunter, if you're licensed a, hunters, if you're a successful hunter, you're in the or you, you are not in the majority. You're, yeah, just you're, by you are in the minority in of hunters. Just less than a quarter of you are going to shoot a deer this yeah. year. 
no matter what season, that's a, that's the other thing. There's and there's eight point five EU uh, per square mile. The estimated population in Vermont is one hundred and forty thousand. Uh, the antlerless hunters. Deer. Oh, deer, deer. Yeah, that's the estimated population. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I know that they have ways of finding it, but I don't. There's no way they can really all, tell though. You know that they're guessing when it's a cool one hundred and forty thousand. Yeah, there's no like <laughs> exactly one hundred and forty thousand one hundred and twenty three. <laughs> no, but there's actually uh, six thousand nine hundred and ninety five antlerless deer. That includes uh, button bucks. Yes, and there's nine thousand eight hundred and fifty antler deer harvested. 45% firearm, 29% archery, 20% muzzleloader, and 6% youth. 20% muzzleloader? Yep. Hmm. How Does it say how many were shot with a muzzleloader? Or yep. just... 20% of 16,800. Oh, 20%. Okay, so... 20% of that. Um, I got stats, not a calculator. I'm going to need one to start doing that. So about 3,200 deer shot with a muzzleloader? Um. No, those are I, just some stats, yeah. but it there's actually four thousand six hundred or there's four hundred and sixty three thousand um acres. In uh, so let's put this back into the rut rut talk yeah, yeah. perspective. Well, I was kind of going to that. Kinda. So what did you say? How much? How much? Forty five percent of. So just say fifty percent of. So eight thousand deer. Nine thousand eight hundred and fifty, actually. Oh uh, no, because that's no, because it, yeah, yeah. so it'd be just a little less than eight thousand deer a shot during the rot, basically. Yep. In Vermont, because right now, which the so this also has. Um, so it sounds like in Vermont, Intel would be. Uh, it sounds like in Vermont that the rot is a pretty productive time to hunt to me. Well, right. No. I but would, the difference is how many guys have a rifle? Yeah. Well, how many guys only hunt with a rifle? That's where I was going with how many guys at camp. This is their first time out. The only reason I think anyone bow hunts at camp is because I started bow hunting five or six years ago. And, and I think Jake got into it and Jaron got into it and we're trying to get the other guys into it, but they work too much too. And they have kids and, I don't know how you guys find time. I I haven't been that much. I really haven't. Um, I was trying to also find... Uh, back, way, way back when, uh, the owner of the camp, he used to bow hunt. And he's got a lot of stories about bow hunting back when bow hunting just started. And he doesn't bow hunt anymore. I'd tell you some of the stories, but I'd get them wrong because <laughs> we'll was, have to have them on the podcast. It was a long time ago that he was telling me those stories, and my mind isn't as good so as it peak, used to be. Peak breeding date um, in Vermont is November. This year is November twelfth. Well, that was three days ago. Yep. So tomorrow should be a pretty good day. If should be. They out. might be back on their feet. The big boys. Yeah, big six and four pointer. Secondary peak breeding is December tenth this year. Yeah. Yep. No, so anyways, I was just kind of that was kind of a off topic, but I'm very excited for the Vermont hunters because their excitement gets me kind of excited. It it was like a a Christmas Eve feel today. It really was. Um, I don't even. I mean, I I would like to. Um, if I if I was going to, like seriously deer hunt tomorrow like if i had a plan to i'd be headed to new york but i punched my tag last week on sunday last sunday last sunday i killed a buck over in new york so that only really leaves right now i think i might try to venture to maine for a couple days at the end of this month trying to hopefully catch some snow but man it just hasn't looked like that's in the weather and then I really don't have much going on here in Vermont where I'm like very anxious to go after anything. Um, I really don't, 
I don't get out into big woods in Vermont, quote unquote, the um, big woods. I don't really get out there because for, uh, like we've been talking about time. You, you know, just don't have time. Yeah, no, it's, it's not that you don't have time. I just, for me, um, I want to make my time worthwhile. So I try to, you know, I just try to find the pockets of deer. And nowadays it's no, no secret deer closer to, closer to, uh, populations, you know, human populations, you know, we create such great habitat for them. So they just come off the hills, especially if you don't have much food in the overgrown forests that Vermont have. So, you know, it's not, it doesn't intrigue me that much anymore to go up into vast woods where there's not much going on. I'd rather just kind of stick around here, but I also have to have something that I'm willing to go after to get excited to go. So yeah, I actually might sit, sit out tomorrow morning, but I'm excited for everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. No, there'll be guys pounding in the woods tomorrow for sure. Yeah. Over you'll, half our you'll deer. Be hearing, you'll be hearing some gunshots in the morning. Yep. Sure. Over half, over half the uh, deer that get harvested in the state is going to be in the 16, next 16 days. days yeah. yeah. So hunting the rut, I mean, um, yeah, I did a little rut hunt um, out of state with my bow uh, last week too. I I was a little bit late. You said you went to you were like November fifth. I think I was the same. It was like what was that? When, yeah, you left the day Wednesday. after us. Yeah, Wednesday the sixth, I think. But. And it was one of those things where it was like long sets. Um, a lot of guys because a lot more guys are hitting the woods. Uh, I was hunting public land. Uh, I saw deer every set. That was a one. One awesome thing that I took away from my rut hunt this year was I saw deer every set. Could have shot a couple small bucks, let them go. Um, I I was really, I really wanted to get a buck, um, but they were just a little too small. And uh, the one good one that I did see never gave me a shot. It was a little too far. But man, it was just, I, it was funny because it was like, We'll, we'll talk about the rut on the podcast because I, I can't wait to talk about the rut on the podcast because, you know what, I think my views could be a little different than than other people. Uh, you know, I you you hear so much, you know, oh, I can't wait to hunt the rut, can't wait. To, it's like, man. It's well, I think different, that's, different that's also the beauty about the sport, you know, is some guys, if you love it, then you love it. If you don't, then you don't. You know, that's yeah. your that's your opinion. It's you know? not that I don't. I guess I don't want to be misleading. It's not that I don't. Some magical things happen when it's that time of year. But what it takes to be successful during the rut, right? Because you got yeah, yeah. It's almost you, like a mindset too, though. Yeah. Like, like maybe this week I love hunting the rut, but next week I don't. You know what I mean? Okay, let me, or like because like you were just talking about going to Maine. I love going to Maine after the rut when there's right. when there's snow. But yeah. if there's no snow, I dread that yeah. same thing. Packing your bags headed to Maine when you know you're not going to have a week of snow. snow you just dread you're like it. this is I've done this before. This is going to suck. You but know? like also too like the rut hunt, right? So like, um, just picture this, right? You walk into a chunk of woods. You're fast scouting, right? And you you show up to some public land. You thought it looked good. Maybe you scouted it from Onyx. During the summertime, you just pick that was your spot. You were going to go drive and check out. You go check out. You get out there, and the thing is torn up. Like, I sent you the rubs that we found. Mm. It was so amazing. Mm -hmm. These rubs were some of the biggest rubs I've ever found in my entire life. And there was a rub line. And there was some scrapes. It had the leaves. You know, I had covered some of them. You really had to kind of look for them or whatever. So there's all this crazy sign, Right. But what's the matter? It's a rut, mm -hmm. right? If there is a doe at all close, that buck's not going to be running that rub line, checking those scrapes. He's going to be glued to her side, and she's going to be two ridges over in the thickest shit she can find. Mm -hmm. And you don't know where he is anymore. You don't know, you know, everything that that sign is telling you, like, oh, it must be this direction he's running because, look, you know, just all like those... I mean, I think some of that is good information, though, right? I mean, that's, there's a big one in the good, area. That's a good place to start, right? There's a big one in the area. I mean, I wouldn't totally discredit finding something like that during the rut. But that's what I mean. You don't know. You no, know, but you don't. And and Luke and I learned this very well. If you if you watch the video that we're we're gonna put up, 
I literally climbed a tree, had one, you know, we're setting up double stands, one for the cameraman, one for, you know, for the guy hunting. And we climb up the tree. I've got one tree stand hung. Buck comes up the ridge. He was a little, he was a funky looking thing. He was, you know, a year, year and a half old deer or whatever. But he comes up, Luke's videoing this deer. I'm standing in the tree holding the tree stand. Luke's just videoing this buck and he's so, he's just dumb, right? So he stands there and looks at us for a while. But we obviously, I saw him come up first. So I saw right where he came from. I knew like kind of the prevailing wind we were going to have on that farm that day. And I said, Luke, that's, that's crazy. You know, the buck took off. I said, I, I really think we should move the stand. I was like, what a better live example of where we happen. should put this tree stand yeah. in this certain spot was it was not a it wasn't it wasn't like a, a bedding border you know what i mean it wasn't hunting the fringe of bedding it was just a cruising spot right and because they have there's so much open field out there you have to they they normally will go you know from from chunk of woods to chunk of woods you know when it's rotten hard you know when they're chasing hard they'll run right through the middle of the field but so what I'm getting at is that spot was like, should we put it here? Should we put our stand here? Should we put our stand here? There's a rub line right here. So we just kind of, what we based our decision off where we should hang that tree stand. And I know a lot of guys do that. They walk into a piece of woods and they're looking like, where should I put this stand? I have no idea. There's so much deer sign here. Where should I put it? It was one of those things, you know, and we decided to move the stand a little bit. And then, and you'll see in the video, it actually almost worked out, but that was just a spot where, you know, deer were running all over the place and, and during, during the rut, that's a tough thing, right? So here, picture this, cause I'm going to, I'm going to draw you a scenario that, right. It, when I, we'll, we'll get into tips of hunting the rut here in a second, like what we kind of do, mm-hmm. but just picture this. And this is another thing that I think kind of falls off. It, it, sometimes, you know, it's common knowledge, but like. Think about this. This buck is with this doe. She's not quite in yet, and his his testosterone has been climbing since the minute he shed velvet. So you get into this time of year, right, and his testosterone is just through the roof, right? As he's as ready to breed as he's going to be. It's been a long year, right? And he goes, gets on this doe. That, that chasing that you're seeing, he's just scent checking her. She's not, you know... He's scent checking her, but, you know, she's close. She's giving off that I'm close. But if she's not standing for him, right, he might go real quick and look. He he might not ever leave her, but let's say there's another buck that kicks him off. Like you guys saw. You saw that, right? Say that buck then leaves that doe. He's so frustrated, and he smashes the absolute shit out of a tree. Yeah. And then you walk in with your tree stand and bow the next day and be like, oh, man, look at this rub. Yep. He's never coming back there. No. And that was his frustration. That it was his frustration. That, you know. But right. another good example of that on the video, you'll see it, is that buck. This this is another thing that can happen. We watched it what three times. The buck, the you know, bucks chasing a doe. It's pretty incredible. You should watch more, the video. It's pretty, more than that. Pretty, pretty, we had well, the, we had an eight pointer, another eight yeah. pointer, a funky horn one, yeah. and a five pointer. And so a couple of these chases a, were pretty insane. And, and like Saturday. you were saying, the yeah, the doe. She wasn't quite ready, but she was she was smelly. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah, they she were was they releasing and her. She pheromones. was like yep. you can tell when they're I mean they and you can tell because they've been chased so hard that they're they literally are hyperventilating. Yeah. But in this certain circumstance where we hung that stand I was just talking about, that buck, this is why it's such a great time of year to call, which is fun. Use use some calling. That buck, I knew what I I figured out what happened, and that's why we got busted. It happened so quick. But he went into that block of woods after that doe. Well, he he must have locked You'll watch them. If you see a chase, they will lose that doe. They can lose him. Like, she might go up on a bank, and he's down here. Like, he he knows she's up there, but he he doesn't have his eyes on her. So, I, I believe what happened in that, that buck that I kind of messed up on because I was texting you in the tree stand, but is he he went in those woods. She ran down in there like a bat out of hell. He lost her for a minute, and at the same moment he was cresting into those woods, I grabbed my grunter, and I gave him two two pretty aggressive grunts. You can see it on the video. Well, I, what was it? Five, not even, it probably wasn't even five minutes, I bet. It was enough time f- for me to do a little interview on the camera. It might have been five to seven minutes. He went in those woods. He lost her. He didn't know where she went, but he heard those grunts. So he figured, hey, man, there's another buck. He must have found her, right? He came right to us. He was looking for whatever just made that grunt when we when I got busted in the tree. 
you know, so that that rub line, you're right, probably didn't mean a lot, but because it, we were it because does. we it does, but because we were there and I was able to grunt and get him to come towards us, you know what I mean? That kind of being in that area definitely helped during the rub because that's where they like that, to run. That rub line, right? It might it might be you know, focused in on a, a, you know, a spot that funnels, it's just good for deer movement. Yep, yep. Might be, you know, the easiest spot to come through. Le- you know, it just doesn't take, you know, much energy to go through there. And that's why those rubs, are, you don't know. But like, that's what I mean, the unpredictability. Picture this, because I've seen this a bunch too. So you got a, a small buck walks through, right? First thing in the morning. Seen this firsthand. Small buck walks through in the morning, right? And he goes by you. And then like eight o'clock in the morning, you know, a little bit later or something, you you catch movement and it's a bigger buck. Still not a shooter, but a bigger buck. He walks, but he's coming from a completely different direction. And when he gets in front of your stand, he crosses where that other buck walked through and he makes a massive scrape. Yep. Right? And then he walks off. He's never coming back there. That's no different than your dog hitting the fire hydrant on the way by, and then my dog coming along later in the day, and, oh, there was another dog here. I'm just letting him know I'm here in case that thing comes back true. It's just like, it's like a, right? So then you can grab your stand, right, when you're doing your speed scouting, be like, oh, here's this massive scrape, Right? It might have just been a, a spot he crossed sent, right? It does help you because, like, all right, deer are coming through here. That's why he's putting these errors because there's deer coming through here. But it, that buck might never come through here again. You know, in that spot. In yeah. that in that spot, like how many? I mean, with our cameras nowadays, that we can we our cameras tell us that, right? I got a picture of a deer one time. Never got a picture of him again, mm-hmm. right? So it's so hard because the sign that's on the ground. It's very hard to read this time of year. And so I guess we just, let's just talk about like tips and like some, some things that I look for, you look for when we're hunting. Kind of what helped me last weekend, right? Cause my New York buck was a, a it was a rut hunt. I mean, this was, what day was it? It was the 10th. It was last Sunday. Mm. Yeah. Which is funny cause my Vermont buck was the 11th last year. So obviously. I killed quite a few deer right around the 10th, too. 11th. You know me what too. I mean? From the fifth, Louis Louis says the tenth. That's his day or whatever. Yeah, the fifth for me. I've killed more bucks on November fifth than any other day of the year. Yep. And I'm and I mean I'm right between November fifth and the tenth. Mm-hmm. You know, in in that time frame, we're we're uh, shooting a lot of deer because cause I don't want I don't want to mislead people. This is a good, I will be in a tree stand. The one thing that I can guarantee you is myself, Dave, and Luke will forever be in a tree stand on these dates. I'm just saying that it's not. I know. So to put in perspective yeah, right. why, because it seems like. They're going to be on their feet. They are No, it, it, right. But what to compare it to a different time of year yeah, or okay. a different part of let's do that. the season. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like. Yeah, let's do that. Like That's even good. early October through. Yes. September. Yeah. And I'll, actually, I'll, I've, I'll say September. the biggest buck I've ever killed, which was in Ohio, was a front on October 29th that had come through. Not even in November yet. You know what I mean? But they're starting. They're starting to, they're starting to search and they're starting to get on their feet. The big boys are. And we're, you know, I'm kind of talking about not specifically targeting like one big deer, but being on, being hunting on a farm or hunting public land. And having a big deer, big enough that I want to shoot, come come through. You know what I mean? That that day was October 29th that year. Biggest yeah. deer, probably the one of the big biggest deer I'll ever shoot. I've killed many bucks late October, October 20th to yeah. the 28th. And and so, so in your opinion, I guess what what is different about that? Time? Why I look forward to that time more than the rut predictability. Right. So yeah, now we're kind of narrowing down why I'm trying to say. Yeah. You know, I love the rut, but I, it's not as predictable as these other dates. I've literally wit- witnessed 
Um, our buddy Louie, we'll get him on here. I think I'm so close to cracking this kid. <laughs> I really do. We just got to, you know, we just got to get him a six pack and he's going to come in here and just blow everybody's mind. Cause he's, he is truly one of the best deer hunters I know. And one of the best archer in, in public land guys that I know. Mm -hmm. Um, he's been doing it for so long, successful every year, killed a big one again this year. Yep. You know, he, he, like myself, we, we've done it for a while and we hunt together and we've actually hunted this rut hunt together, but I've seen some of the biggest deer hit the ground in September. And why is that fun for me? Because they're still in a summer pattern. And if you find what they're eating and you find that fresh sign, I can guarantee you if the wind is right and I go into the stand and it is the favorable food source, like, and they'll tell you because their sign is going to be hot and fresh. If you can get in there, you are going to see these deer. Yep. It's very predictable. If if the weather's right, right, it has to be the weather right. You have to be close to your average temperatures. And I'm telling you, you can predict deer movement at that point. And so it is much more enjoyable for me to be like, okay. And granted, I'm not saying every time out in the woods you see a deer, but you've just improved your odds so greatly that, yeah, I didn't see anything tonight, but you know what? Thermal could have been doing something I'm I'm not seeing, and they smelled me, or maybe they just had somewhere else to be tonight, which is always a possibility. They're free ranging, but I don't care. I know I'm on them. Mm -hmm. I know I'm on them. Just give me another night or two, and I'm going to run into them. And that predictability just makes it more of an anticipation. All right, it's getting down to the last half hour of the night. I'm going to see these deer. There's like an excitement there. But when I'm sitting in the stand, I go in the morning, I'm probably overtired, you know, haven't been eating great, haven't been sleeping great, long travel, probably not feeling my best or sharpest, waking up early, going out to the tree, getting up in the tree stand, and you're like, anything can happen, you know, and, and for that, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit, I, you know, I hunt funnels, things that narrow down deer movement, because... If you start getting into bigger woods, right, just it is, just anticipate days and days and days and days and days. I can tell you about a time I hunted New York, man. I hunted it hard. This is probably before my traveling days with the bow. I was just rifle. I mean, every day off I could have, every weekend, and I hunted and hunted and hunted the Adirondacks. During the rut, this is during the rut and not seeing anything for deer and then finally i had a chase a doe, a doe i was sitting at a tree doe literally almost ran over me she was so close to the tree ran by me 100 miles an hour like i didn't even have time it was just and i look up and this doe just runs over my feet pretty much and then i hear and i look up and here's this four pointer i mean he was like tiny four pointer just runs right by 100 miles an hour. I was like, boom, boom. It was like two NASCARs going by, boom, boom. And then I look up, and there's a spike horn and a three-pointer. All three of them are chasing that doe and just running. As, the last one was the spike horn. And when I'm, just, I'm like, looking around and moving, and that thing, he man, he hit the brakes, doom, like, and looked right at me. And he was like, if you shoot me, shoot me, but I got to get by you. Yeah. Like, do what you're going to do, but I got to get by you. And then I just kind of looked at him, and then he was like, okay, you're not shooting, wham. And he just goes around me, and boom, down the hill. And it was like 100 miles an hour, and I'd been sitting for days without any action, and it was like, bam, action. And so I, I got the gun ready, and I'm like looking around like, okay, where's the, where's the big buck? Like, holy crap, that was really, really intense. You know, my just – my heart is just beating through my chest and I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like, and then a minute goes by, two minutes go by, three minutes go by. And that was my New Yorker up. That was it. Yeah. That there, was it. That there was one no big buck. That one moment. Yeah. That one moment. But guess what? I absolutely stacked them up in December when they came back on food. Right. And it, and <laughs> so the, but was that, it as exciting? Oh, of course yeah dude yeah, dragon deer out yeah. yes what are you talking about yeah no i i mean I you gotta think about why though right it's a different kind yeah. of excitement it's just a different kind of excitement 
So they're they're slaves to their stomach, right? I mean, we. Oh yeah, don't so, ever. So that's think a, about what bucks are doing pre rut, right? And then what they're doing post rut. They're doing the same right. thing, but for a different reason, right? Pre rut, they're putting the feed bag on because they know there's going to be like a couple of weeks of pretty intense running around. They're not going to eat much. Post rut, they're starving, right? So they're going to be back on that food yeah. source. That's why when you said it's predictable, that's where the predictability comes from, and that's yeah. why they're doing that. And also them preparing for the rut is predictable because, you know, uh, excuse me, a, a doe with a fawn, she's going to stay on green, you know, as long as she can because it's just a rich, palatable milk for her young. And, and anybody who's bow hunted in Vermont in early October has probably seen a doe that still has a fawn trying to feed mm-hmm. or has put a knife through their dry sack and got some milk out of it. Like, that's what they're still doing. They're, they are still very much, you know, nursing young. So those are going to stay on green. Well, that buck needs like high, high. What do you got? Trail cam picture? Coyote. Oh, behind the house? Yep. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I got, dude, I got, uh, I got pictures too. I get, you just got to put it down. Of course you I know. do, man. You can look Go at on it. a podcast and he shows up. Yeah. So anyway. You, the predictability that we're talking about, you can predict right right early season what a buck's going to be feeding on, right? Because he's gonna he knows that he's going to abandon food for the uh, for doe, right? So what's he got to do? He's got to put as much fat on as he can. So what's he going to be in? Acorns, apples, corn, things that put it on. So you can you can separate. You know, you could be over a nice green clover field early October, and well first couple of acorns drop and you're missing the buck movement you're yep. just going to see a bunch of nannies so on that green i guess we pretty much kind of covered that part of the rut right what you know as far as you know the unpredictability part but to re- let's just get into some tips and and stuff that you you kind of live by and and you know we'll see what luke thinks too about what he likes to do but you know what what do you what are you looking for? Like if you're going, you're just going to pack up and head to, you know, Kentucky or Ohio or something, and you're going to get on your Let me, what, are, what are you going to? I'm going to do, for? can I just kind of cover my rut hunt from Adirondacks? Yeah. Because that happened last week, and I think that would be really relevant to the guys that are hitting the woods in Vermont because that's the same type of woods, big, yeah. vast woods, yeah. right? Because Kentucky and Ohio and stuff, those tips, I, it's pretty straightforward. I I mean, it's not really straightforward, but I, I am – looking for narrow down deer movement with but sometimes you do get into bigger woods so when you have to get into bigger woods this is kind of what worked for me this last week um so i shot a six pointer he's a 150 pound six pointer um it was the first day i rifle hunted this year and it was just time to get a buck it, it really was it's what it boils down to it was time to get a buck um i really don't see that favorable weather uh coming i like to track like i'm a bow hunter you'll kind of find out I'm a bow hunter, but I'm also a rifle guy. But if I got a rifle, I like to track, but like my style of deer hunting, I'm going to do whatever is needed to do to get a deer. Right. If that means you got to sit all day, I'll sit all day. If that means you got to walk 10 miles, I'll walk 10 miles. If that means you got to track them on snow, I'll track them on snow. If there was a, I always said, if there was a season for slingshot, I'd be out there trying it, right? I'd be hitting them in the, between the eyes of the marbles. You know what I mean? I, it's just, I will do whatever it takes to get my tag filled, right? And it got to the point where I, now I'm not sure, I don't have a lot of vacation time left. I'm going to be a weekend warrior. Um, I saw a buck that made me happy. It was, he was 6.150 pounds, super pumped, but. In big woods. So what did I do to kind of run into this deer? Um, it kind of goes back to that conversation we had a week ago. If you go back to some of our podcasts, we talked about wind. In those big woods settings, I over in the Adirondacks, um, up, it, when, you, when you're in the elevation in, in areas, I call them, I call them Indian kettles. Um, the Indian kettles are parts of the mountain that hold water that grow marshy grass, or sometimes they're ponds. Like you can find ponds up in the mountains and stuff. 
But in, in any of these spots that just trap water, you can you can grow, and especially if you have any wind damage from storms, you can find cover. So I got this little spot. It was kind of close to cover. Um, I got into the spot close to cover. There was a, a ridge, right? And as I'm getting to this area, I said, you know what? Play that wind to my to my southeast, I had this cover. And it's almost the cover where it's like, I don't want to go in there. If I go in there, I'm going to push deer out. Okay. So that came to mind immediately. All right. Start hunting. If you feel that way, if I'm going to go in here and I'm going to kick deer out, then I have to assume that maybe there might be some deer in here. This is good cover, especially that cover that we know that does are trying to hide from bucks. Look around a little bit. I find like this little rub on like a pen. Like it was like four pencils together. I mean, it was just like a little sapling, little beach sapling that was rubbed. Like, okay. So there's, there's deer around. I, I was obviously finding some other deer tracks, deer scat. So I'm finding the stuff that you putting things together. There's deer here, right? There's brows. There's uh, the barberries. If anybody doesn't know what those are, the barberries are the little red berries on those little, they, they'll browse on them. So there's a little something to eat too. So now I'm like putting all this stuff together. Well, as this ridge starts going up, right, the wind was southeast. So the wind was hitting the ridge, but I'm over here. It's now like 11 o'clock, 10, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. So I realized I'm not going to go into this area because I'll kick deer out. I have to sit. So as much as I'd love to keep poking around, it's time to sit because the wind is going to be hitting the side of this hill and it's going to get later in the day and that thermal is going to start dropping off the hill. Dude, five hours and 45 minutes into that sit, a buck came walking probably the line on the ridge where the scent and thermal were hitting each other, Mm -hmm. nosing 80 yards from me. I saw, I put him in the scope. I had my, uh, 760 308 carbine, fun little gun to carry. I got it a couple of years ago. Fun little gun. Love the 308. Um, in, in that gun is, I, I killed two now with it, but saw him, saw he had a rack. Um, so I had some, some points. I knew he had a brow. I wasn't really seen much, but I had already at that point decided I was going to kill him. So he just kind of walked up the hill and he, he was doing that nose down step, nose up a couple steps, nose down a couple steps, but he was never breaking stride. And he was going kind of along the hill and he just stopped in a spot where I, I could get a shot at him and I dropped him. But that was all the thought process into sitting there for five hours. I said, if the deer are in there, if one wanted to scent check that, maybe one goes through it. Maybe they chase around here. Not sure. There's some deer tracks. Here's some deer sign. I got to sit because if I stay on my feet in this bare ground, crunch, it's been dry, this crunchy ass shit, I'm just going to be pushing deer around. So it was time to sit five hours, 45 minutes into it. That buck did exactly what I thought one might do. Yeah. He came right up. He sent check that whole area that was, I considered the, the cover. He sent checked it. And it was funny because right before... It was probably about 15, 20 minutes before that I saw a button buck and a doe come out of that. And they stayed to the left. They were to, they came through to the left of me. And uh, I was like, okay, here's some deer. So they are in there. They're coming out. And sure enough, he was just cruising the ridge, scent checking out that, that area. Man, it worked perfect. So that was my – it's all – I don't think you can listen to this podcast and then just go try to find that – topography and try to hunt it that same exact way it's all different it's all you have to be standing there and you have to try to put that kind of stuff together i think to like make it work but that's what i did in the bigger area right no and and you kind of mentioned before like you found you know you kind of try to find these pockets of deer because it is such a vast wilderness a lot of a lot of times i mean there will there might be some cover that nothing's living in except a rabbit you know what i mean oh yeah no doubt you know what i mean 
I found a rub, right? Yeah, a few, a few things. I found a, I found a scrape. Yeah. There and was that, a scrape there. There's so. a few things that you found that you you felt like you know may, I need to slow right. down and just kind of yep. yeah without no busting these deer out of there. But I wasn't, I wasn't like oh rub oh scrape, you know I'm gonna sit on that. Not what I was sitting on. I was more of using it. Okay, the reason the scrape is there because does are in here. Mm-hmm. He's only gonna put that there because. There's other deer using it, mm-hmm. right? And the rub, okay, well, all right, there's an antler deer around here. But the tactic that way was I was using the wind right, all day. Right. It, I was in a spot where if a deer came behind me, man, nah, no way. I was never seeing that deer. But I, I didn't, that's the luck part, I think. You know, if if for whatever reason the deer did come from, behind me i would have never known it and maybe for five hours and 45 minutes i had six different bucks come from that direction i never knew it but when i finally had the one come from the direction where the wind played in my favor yeah man that that worked like a charm that really worked like a charm you know it was a neat experiment that me me and luke luke and i did uh, quite a few times was i bought like i always had that um it was just like a puff bottle, like to oh, check yeah, yeah. or whatever, which yep. works good, right? Gives you a general idea. And then uh, we went to Walmart out there, and they had um, little canisters with the milkweed in it. Yeah, yeah. If you guys, you know, if people listen, and if you really want to learn what we're talking about with thermals and wind, get yourself some milkweed because we did a bunch of different. There is a ex- scene where you can see that. You're doing yeah. that after we jump a buck out of where we're going to put a stand. Yeah, it, it, if you want to learn about thermals, we we were literally, you know, because I'd never really done that. I just kind of knew, kind of how thermals worked and stuff. But there was a there was one stand that we had hung, and we had a questionable win, and we said we're we're gonna sit here tonight because we think it's gonna work. Me and Luke talked about it a bunch. In my head, it wasn't really gonna work, but Luke thought about it, and he's like, "No, I think you're thinking, I think your compass is off a little." So we decided to go in there and and. Uh, Luke was actually was very right because the way that the wind was blowing, it was a it was like a southwest wind or a west wind. But the way our stand was positioned gave us just enough yardage from where these bucks these bucks were coming out of this bottom, and they all came out of the bottom. None of them went down, you know, from left to right. Right, they weren't coming out of this CRP stuff down into the bottom. They were all coming out of the bottom. So that, in my mind a west wind was completely eliminating the stand. But then I thought about it. I'm like, well, 99, well, let's say 90% of 10 bucks that come out of here come from the bottom. So then me and Luke, long story short, I pulled out in the morning, right? It's what, seven o'clock. The sun just came up, pull it out. West wind, milkweed blows over. We're, we're kind of, so the bottom comes down. We're like sitting halfway down the bottom elevated so we're over the bottom you know we're we're up on the top of the bottom right milkweed goes out and just kind of blows straight right straight out low so by the time it's hitting the crp that we're basically level with it's still low give it a couple hours right stuff starts warming up a little bit sun comes up no shit yeah you let that milkweed go it hits the very edge of that where that crp stuff and it goes straight up in the air yep and it blows what probably 20 30 feet over their heads or something like that if that yeah, yeah. i mean more than that I get this yeah. when i so pretty it was a pretty it amazing test. that way for a, like 100 yards yeah it went yeah it, it went a long ways so thermal is a very tricky thing to master and i think the masters at it still learn from day to day because like i had a situation um and nothing tipped me off from how it was being used then just it was so calm and it was so calm and the leaves i was watching the leaves right on the trees and i was sitting close to this massive river it was like the otter creek so if anybody in our area that knows what i'm talking about otter creek but it was actually probably twice the size of it And I wasn't sitting that far off. So I'm trying to, I'm hunting a bean field and I'm sitting in the narrowest part of the bean field. So there's like a a chunk of woods to my south and a chunk of woods to my north. And I'm kind of in the most narrowest 
spot that I'm going to get a I'm going to get a chip shot to my west and I'm going to get a chip shot to my east. I'm north is to my back and I'm looking south. Just the way that the tree that I picked worked out. But I'm it's a rut. This is, they're going to funnel through here if they got to go through these two spots. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching and I was like, you know, I don't really know there's no wind. This is like dead calm. And and there's always some kind of wind, but this is dead calm. But I look over to my right and I can see these leaves and they're just outright and they're kind of just waving towards that massive river. So I sit there for a minute and I'm like, that's so odd. And then all of a sudden I feel the wind on my neck, right? But it's, it's from the riverside. So my West it's hitting me on the neck and I'm like, all right, there's a breeze, but it's to my West. And as it's happening, that leaf is still out. Almost like it's a East to West, like a East wind going towards the West. And I sat there and I went, wow, son of a gun, that river, the current of that river is pulling almost like a vacuum sucking yeah. that thermal down into that river. I was like, holy crap. This, although the wind kind of, it, it didn't matter where I was set up. You know, I couldn't have a, a north wind. I couldn't have a south wind because then my wind was going into the big chunk that these deer were going to be. So I was like, all right, if there was a west wind, it's kind of blowing out towards that bean field. I'm kind of all right because if they come, they'll, by the time they're getting my sound, I'm getting a shot. Same with the other side. But it was just very cool to see and think about like, man, you could even be a master at figuring out how thermals go up and down and sun, no sun. But who thinks about the vacuum that a river current is pulling right from a ways away? And I was like, holy shit, that's what it is. I do, And I do know one thing from, so I bet you when it warmed up, that was probably not as bad. Right. Right. Yeah, because it would get away. From, it would get away from the river. Right. Yes. It, right. And the only way I, the only way I picture this in my head is like, I feel like because of my sugaring that I've done maple sugaring with with vacuum systems and everything, I feel like like the water cooled pumps that I used to have. If they would get hot, you would actually lose a little bit of vacuum for whatever reason. But that I think you're right. The cooler that it is, for whatever reason, it, that river was creating a vacuum, and and it I think was, just the speed of the current, right? Yeah, it's and like also a, you know like what? A, can, it's like a car know. going by. Yep. Right. If a car goes by you, you're on the sidewalk, and that car goes by you, your shirt gets pulled in the direction the car was going. Right. 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 So that that it's, it's that pushes, air yeah, pushing it around that, it. Yeah. But yeah. just that that current, man. It, and you know what can affect that too is is your your barometric pressure. Yeah. Oh that yeah. Can, this that is can all, affect. See, this is why we're saying yeah. thermal is a tricky game. It is. Yeah. But it, if the obvious ones are there and you know how to read it, you can actually hunt on wrong winds. Cause like you said, yeah. like you had, you might have been like, all right, these deer are down in the CRP. I can't hunt, you know, that because the wind's wrong. But if you had the rising thermal, your sensor's going to go over them anyway. You can hunt a wrong wind. And that's what we said. Yep. You know, uh, it was, yep. it, it's like, what you've been taught with wind is like, you can't sit there. It's going to, blow. but really. It actually like, did work honestly, out. Honestly, if we waited, we if we slept in, right, and got there at nine when the thermals start heating up, you're good. You know, it's just, yeah. it's sucking it straight up in the air, you know. And it actually did work out, but the buck that came in was just a funky horn. Yeah. Like, it, I don't know if it had seven or eight points, but it was a spike horn. Yeah, it was a Check spike. Check out the yeah. video. It yeah. looked like a red yeah. stag, actually. There were yeah, a couple like of them elk. around <laughs> yeah. there that just had wicked weird yeah. tines. Hmm. But, yeah, no, so that's that's some stuff that I learned, you know, or that's what we have learned over the years, you know, I'm trying to throw it out there. To, to be relevant, I know a lot of guys that are around this area that hunt bigger woods just to be relevant, you know with hunting the rut and, and tips and tactics, you know, I would say just uh, keep in mind, this is all, you know, it's not like we're reinventing the wheel here. A lot of this stuff that we're talking about, you know, I think it's good because we have 
of the time in the field that have like, like if I listen to somebody's theory, I, you gotta understand. I listen to everybody. I listen to everybody. I'm a nut when it comes to this stuff and I'll listen to everybody. But if my experience that I have in the woods, my actual time in the woods debunks your theory, there's not going to, it's not going to hold weight with me. Right. Well, so, it's, it's going back to the whole, you know, deer are not just willy nilly in it through life. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, they're, there's they're a rhyme and reason. There's a rhyme and reason for everything they do. But if I've done this before too, especially in the big woods, especially in like Maine. Yeah. Sometimes you do, you, sometimes you get like tunnel vision and you're, you're, uh, you know, you kind of forget what you're doing. You're just walking in the woods a little bit, you know, you get in that, it's been, you know, you're, it's been a while, you've been hunting for a few days and you're just kind of walking and then, and you, and you think that you're looking for sign or you're, and you get in this and then all of a sudden you just stop and you're like, why am I not paying attention to mother nature like everything in this setting i'm in right now has a reason for being here and deer deer use that to survive so sometimes i feel like if you just stop and smell the roses a little bit oh yeah you're gonna find what we're talking about way quicker than you would imagine i know what i mean yeah i'd like i believe they're so in tune with every little last detail of life that you know when like you got like a bad feeling, maybe it's like uh, just that feeling you get maybe when you were a kid and your buddies were doing something wrong in school and you had that bad feeling like you were going to get caught or just like maybe it's like, you know, um, it's hard to explain, but like sometimes with with like tragedy, you, you kind of have a bad feeling the way people are acting. You have a bad feeling and you get that feeling. I think deer can actually use that. I think, I think they have to. I, I think they do because I've had deer without rhyme or reason walking right into a stand and then freeze. And then they kind of just kind of like it's look like around. It's yeah. like this intuition they have. Yeah. yeah, right. And I really think that they just got a bad feeling, but they listen to it. Like if only we could figure out a way how to listen to that bad yeah. feeling. And some people can. Yeah, some people do. But I think deer are really good at it where they're like, man, I don't know. You know how we both. Well, what a risk management or something. There was something yeah. you said on one of the other podcasts, right? I think deer are very good at risk management, right? Yeah. So they walk into a situation, and they're like, "Man, that oak tree's right over there. All I got to do is like walk another fifty yards, and I'm going to be eating it and like really tasty yeah. acorns." Risk averters. Yeah, but that ten percent of them that's like. I don't know, man. And something is not right. They're just really <laughs> good know. at like, yeah, no, it's yeah. not worth the risk. I'll go I'll find go, an oak, yeah. you know, a oak tree somewhere else. Yeah. You know, they just have really, really good, good memory. What's that? Yeah. Uh, they look at the ground and they're like, that leaf was turned the other way before. And it wasn't as flat. Somebody's here. <laughs> I do think Maybe. deer do have good memory. <laughs> I do think deer have really good memory. Well, I, it, it makes you think like, how does a buck get to like eight years old? Like, hey, why are all these branches cut away? Imagine, like, every state that a buck lives in, you can shoot them, right? Every state that a buck lives in has predators that will eat them mm. any time of the day. Right. You know, they must have some recollection of. Oh, no. What you about know what the, I mean? Like, like no, what about the, remember the that lease that we did in Ohio? Yeah. And we got down there. It wasn't quite what we thought it was going to be. Oh, yeah. That deer walked into the stand. Which was a pre-hung stand. The guy had some stands hung, and for the first night there, when we shook hands, the guy left. We're like, "Oh, let's go set, like observation set. We'll just use the stands." Which I'm glad he did because that tree stand that he had was comfortable as hell, and I ended up buying some. But again, the tree stand that night, the deer came in and looked right up. Yeah, it remembered something. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I'm not it, sure what it was, but it remembered something. I think just like we've evolved, right, over from whatever mm-hmm. cavemen, whatever, right up through. Why can't why can't deer evolve, right? Why can't deer when deer were first deer, you know, they never expected the Indians to be up in a tree, right, shooting them with a bow or a spearing them or whatever, you know what I mean? And that was a long time ago. Well, they did so jump they, in trees and spear them from the trees. No, that's what I mean, but back then it was probably way easier because deer never expected to look up. The first human The only thing that would get first. them is yeah, the only thing that would get them is on the ground. Right. You know what I mean? 
So why why wouldn't it be that they've evolved over the last however long, thousand years? They, you mean, know what I mean? They probably have. Yeah. It, it depends on the deer you're hunting and what their experience is. You know yeah, I mean? that's true too. Because like you go, you get some big boys in Maine and you can tell they've probably never seen a human before. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the first, the first, when you're on their track. Yeah. And the first time you catch up to them, they startle you because you, you're huffing along or you're not. You know, you you think you might have more time or whatever, and he might have just stood up out of his bed, and you didn't realize he was going to bed. And you look up, and bang, 40 yards, there he is, yep. standing there looking at you, and you probably could have seen him 40 yards ago. Yep. That's just a deer that's like, what is this thing? Like, well, I remember one time yeah. you were like, that deer must have been, th- I think it was a deer that you killed. He goes, yeah, I, you walked up that deer pretty much. He just bounded once. You killed him in Maine. That, yeah, yeah. That eight the eight-pointer, eight yeah. yeah. And you were like, yeah, I think that this thing just was like, man, am I going to have to fight this thing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, right. That's, yeah, because he didn't, I mean. Didn't do anything crazy. And maybe maybe he knew I was following him. Maybe he didn't, but. You so know. to get back to that tip for rut hunting, bigger woods, I would say for guys, um, definitely find your sign. Like Davey's saying, don't abandon the sign. I was just kind of making some points on how a sign is made and, and the fact that sometimes it goes cold a little bit and you got to determine warmer sign, but. It is a good starting point that you are in deer, so that is a good start. But if you can't funnel them down, um, if you can't funnel them down, then then it gets harder. So start thinking about how they might be using the wind on some of these ridges, like I, you know, like I did last week. You know, I kind of really I figured how they were using the wind, and I put myself in a place on that ridge where one might use the wind, and that was his funnel. There's acres and acres and acres around me but i made it a funnel or a smaller spot because that's how the wind was coming down that's how the thermal was sliding down the hill that's how the wind and where it met and booyah there's your funnel so think of it outside the box a little a little bit um another thing is don't abandon food do not abandon food whatsoever you know i uh i do listen to so many other podcasts i listen i probably listen to all of them youtube and a lot of other things and one thing that i i i listen to that i wish i could speak on a little bit when i hear guys talking about it is like uh, features terrain features and here's my input on a terrain feature right so you can do this whole mapping scouting from onyx um here's my thought on it right that looks like a really good saddle from your couch when you're looking through you mountain know, this ranges, this happens on, so many times, yeah, dude. It looks like a really good saddle from, and then you get up there, and yes, it is the ideal saddle for deer movement. But I'm going to tell you right now, deer ain't going to move through there if there's not food on one side of that mountain or the other. Right. Do not abandon food. Food is key to their survival. In fact, you know, here's another another thing we talked about the other day too was water. Yeah, water. And oh, certainly, a water. lot of people. Yes. Overlook water. And I did it. We that's why we had that conversation. I said, you know what? I was like, I don't I don't even think about water. Like Oh yeah. That's everybody's like food, food, food. That's what I'm gonna be sitting over well, in the morning. I can yep. I can tell you what. Smart. It's super smart. I can tell you what, that day um it rained. It rained a couple of days when we were in Ohio, right? It'd been super dry. So this little creek in that bottom we were hunting had water in it. Was it the day we left? There was like six or seven buck that. No, that was through. the day. That was or maybe the, the day, day that you had decided that the wind was wrong, so we went to the other stand. Yeah, yeah. That morning, a bunch of small bucks, though. But yeah, they're all. I they think five or six, small. seven small buck come up through that creek. You want to know why? There's water. Because there's water in it. Yeah. So for people that want to know the science behind that, deer get seventy percent of their water through their vegetation, and through the food that they eat. That's how their body collects water. They don't really need a drink like we do. They can be out in a clover field, and they're getting their water intake through the plant. Right? That's the science behind it. When a buck is chasing and rutting, and they are chasing like you guys saw, go on to YouTube, check this video out. Luke just just finished it. We're going to have it up probably tonight. Go check it out, and you'll see the chasing that they're talking about. It is like full-on chasing. Well, a buck cannot go sit and eat 20 pounds of clover to get his water. He needs to go get a drink quick. It's the quickest way for him to rehydrate, and that's water. And like I was talking about the Adirondacks, I call them Indian kettles. Mm-hmm. So that's just what I grew up calling them as a kid. It, they're Indian kettles. Um, 
I yeah, think don't don't overlook that. Don't because overlook it, huge, especially during the rut. I mean, it's it's a quicker way for a buck like Sean said to get a drink. He doesn't have time or the energy to go to yeah to digest a bunch of clover. Right? He's he's gonna look for a little bit of water. But if know? there's no water and there's no food, a deer is not gonna walk ten miles out in the woods because that's a nice saddle. Not gonna happen. No. You can pick some amazing terrain features. You go on any YouTube channel, people explain terrain features, how deer use them or whatever. But I'm going to tell you right now, through experience, this is my own experience, do not abandon food because they are just not going to use, they're not going to use a terrain feature if there's nothing benefiting them while they're there. And they make their living eating and drinking, sleeping, and breeding yep. like that's that's their job that's what they go clock in nine to, you know they know nine to five it's 24 7 deer make a living out there it's just don't don't forget that if you find great terrain features while you're out hunting and you're pounding through the mountain or whatever and you're like oh this is ideal saddle we'll look around make sure that there's something there that would put a deer out in that saddle yep yep and um yeah the uh Saddle, shelf, bench, uh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. What I, I mean, I just keep saying, I keep saying saddle, but there's more terrain features that funnel movement. But yeah, I think, I think the biggest thing is those funnels, man. If you can find them funnels, especially around ag stuff or yeah, ag, if you're hunting yeah. ag, we didn't really get into that that much. But if yeah, Luke's, I'm going to, I'm going to bounce yeah, out. Go for it, man. Everyone's going to be asleep at camp. You good? Yeah. No, no. You go <laughs> for it, man. It's, uh, good luck tomorrow. Good luck tomorrow. You guys too. Good luck, everybody yeah. out there. Yeah. All right. We'll have this out probably Monday. Yeah, probably Monday morning. We'll have it Monday. So we'll we'll probably do a one next week on what what we see for deer getting tagged here in Vermont. So. Yeah. All right, Luke. Good luck. See ya, bud. But uh, yeah, we'll just we'll kind of we'll, we'll we can wrap this up a little bit, but we'll we keep talking a little bit because we are hitting some good points. Remember, but like funnels, like funnels in ag country, that's perfect spots. Um, even like. I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to be related to the people um, hunting bigger woods because it, I want it to apply to everybody. But um, yeah, if you're hunting ag country, man, a little narrow strip of timber that, you know, two tracks. I mean, this is, so just, this, that's, maybe, basic. Uh, that's basic. For like the Northeast guys, the big woods, like Maine guys or even like Northern New Hampshire and stuff. I mean, one of the things up there that I would always try to find because there's literally water everywhere up there, right? So that's not like, it's not like a big, that's, you know, they can get it it pretty much if they want. But, you know, some of the stuff I try to find up there is like cuts that would have, that would be like two or three years old, right? That was like the, like two or three year old cuts that had some good brows growing up in them. You know what I mean? So not only do have food, They've got cover and they always have water nearby up there, right? But so, you know, you could find some of those cuts, you know, just kind of pay attention to, it's not really hard to, to kind of figure out how old a cut is, you know, depending on the growth that's in it. When they get too overgrown, then, you know, I almost think you're kind of wasting your time getting into them things because they're, they're almost too thick, but you know, two or three year old cut, they're going to have some good browsing and that's, that's about the only thing to eat up there for them deer, you know, so in the in the big woods up there that's kind of what i like to look for you know and then you can also you can kind of find pinch points and funnels um up there because of all the water right yeah. large bodies of water up there that's true um stuff like that but I also, then, you know generally we're trying to hunt on snow up there so yeah and usually you're trying to find a track yeah you know obviously everybody rides roads i'm no different i don't think davy's any different we nope. try to find a track on the road and then go take it but if i couldn't find a track Right. If I couldn't find a track and I'm hunting up in Maine or something, you know, and you don't really, you know, Maine's awfully flat in a lot of places we hunt. So I'm going to look for those hills, right? I'm going to look for those rises because if a buck is going through the sea of flatness, you know, he can use heights to his advantage and, and maybe pick up a scent a little better. Scent, rent, you know, scent check in a ridge using rising thermals right so like i think a lot of times you'll find that trackers oftentimes when they pick up a track if it didn't cross the road and they're out in the woods using it they're either right on top of the mountain when they find that track and it's almost like the bucks are running the very tippy top or he's partially up one side or the other you know he's 
he's or i mean even if they run the bottom of one maybe it's a really you know the thermal's really dropping up up there though to one but height i'm i'm yeah looking, no I'm he's using the elevation I, i'm I, using I, elevation just to i think deer to, do that everywhere right i mean like yeah. we talked about but especially up there in maine when they're, where it's a little bit flatter um you know because i've tracked a lot of bucks up there and They'll start on a knob, they'll go down into a bog, but you know what? The reason they got to go down in the bog is because the other knob's on the other side of it. They have to yeah. get there, you know what I mean? So it's, um, but yeah, I, yeah, I, think, was... I think you can apply all those tactics to pretty much anywhere you go. It's just, so the Midwest is just was... a little different because it's, yeah, we, there isn't those big woods, you know what I mean? Right. Which to me, that's, I, I love hunting that. I love hunting those, that, that yeah. ag land because it's, it's so much easier to find those funnels and those pinch points, right? Because, you know, you mix in a few houses, a pond, and some ag fields that are wide open. I mean, they, they're they going to go through that chunk of woods, right? Yeah. So. And don't forget, we're archery hunters. So you got to get a 40-yard shot at these things yeah. are in. Well, I mean. I, I'm, yeah. I'm even closer than that. I don't even shoot 40 yards anymore. But, I, I mean, regardless, rifle. Right. You can do oh, whatever you but can. Like you that's can, why we travel to the Midwest because right. all hunting is a little more fun when you right. can, you can get. But you know what? I'm going to say this. You know, I learned a lot hunting in Vermont, and I I learned I I grew up in the Adirondacks. Yeah, right. That Eastern Lake region, where my son. That's where my parents brought me to summer every year. You know, they they had a house. You know, over there they have a house over there still. But when I was a kid. And had no choice, no babysitters. I grew up over there. So I'm very much at home over in the Adirondacks, which is big mountains. And I learned how to hunt over there. Me and you killed, when we could first drive and first had our hunter li- hunting license, you know, we we had so much fun in the Adirondacks. Mm-hmm. Like countless memories in the Adirondacks. So big woods. I, I cut my teeth on, on those woods and... My first buck I ever killed was a main buck, right? So, I, I mean, I'm, you know, don't don't get it wrong. Like, we definitely enjoy our bow hunting in these higher deer density areas where we go and, you know, uh, ag lands and everything else. But I cut my teeth in, in the Green Mountains. I cut my teeth in Maine. I cut my teeth in the Adirondacks. Uh, this is where I grew up. Um, and I learned a lot over the years hunting these areas but where i really learned it is where i could get to an area where i could watch deer hands down when i started like don't write off the guy that packs his bags for weeks and and goes to ohio or illinois or you know if if you are a big woods guy and you're like oh well this guy just travels to go get a deer or whatever don't write him off because I think the most dangerous hunter in the woods or the some of the best hunters are the ones that can master both. And I think that the guys that get time watching deer, a lot of deer, you saw deer in bucks what, every single set while you were in Ohio? Yeah. And you learn by watching? I learned a ton this year. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell you right now, those deer in Ohio, they, they live in a different area. It's just like human beings. We live up here in New England, but there's people that live in the cities. Higher density in the cities. But we're still the same creature, right? And that's no different than the deer. So if you can learn by through watching a lot of deer and then you come back to these bigger, vaster, emptier woods, man, if you have any time in these mountains and, and you can also apply what you learned, man, be careful. Because I'm going to tell you what, I mean, Maine, I'll tell you what, Maine, I, I learned a lot of valuable lessons in Maine, but, you know, I'm hunting it better than I ever used to because I'm applying what I what I learned through watching deer out in the Midwest. Right. You know, there's a lot of truth to that. And, man, I think watch any hunter that is somebody who's eager to learn, and boy. Yeah, and I think a lot of, you know, some guys say, well, I'll guys from vermont and new hampshire and maine they're the best hunters around and they you know they they're better than anybody from midwest i I've i disagree with it oh yeah, yeah and I've i disagree totally like i do too the guys in the midwest for one thing they're patient 
Um, for another thing, they don't shoot little bucks. But like you just said, these guys have been doing it for 40 years in the Midwest. They've watched a lot of deer running around. You put them up in Maine, you give them Onyx, let them drive around a little bit, I bet you they're going to kill some slammers. Well, up. I always said this, right? I always said this. So, um, yeah, I don't know if the Midwest guys that have only been – this is why I think you need to blend of both both guys. The guys that are just Midwest, I don't think they really like bigger woods. No. Right? So, so there's <laughs> that. There's that. So if you got – if you got but they don't they don't need to right because right they don't but really I did I do much. say this I do think this if let's say you gave a Vermonter a piece of land right in Maine right X amount of acres doesn't matter and then you gave a guy from the Midwest uh the same acreage in Maine or just let's just say nowhere right. I mean, I, we don't need to be state specific, but just nowhere. The, but it's the identical tracks of land. I guarantee you, the guy from the Midwest is going to have some massively impressive deer a lot sooner than the guy that came from around here. Oh yeah, yep. Right. We might hunt it harder, right? And we might pound the woods, but can you let that deer go? Right, like that guy out there, Ken. He's he's picked one deer, and that's what he devoted his season to. He's going to be able to. They they got the you know they they got the land management part down, right? I think too many guys around here, you know, like I yeah, I was listening to somebody tonight shoot their gun. Right, it's like holy crap, this might be the first time anybody's thought about deer season yet this year. But you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's one of those things where it's like, it's very, it's very, uh, two different worlds. But I think if, I think if everybody's happy killing what they're killing. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. No I, I really do hate the guys that are, that are stuck to one way. Oh, I guess hate is a strong word, but I, I disagree with the guys that, uh, kind of just say that guys up here are better hunters than anybody else. Cause. Yeah, I don't think so. I, you know, it's just, you know, it's all perspective, I suppose. But um, yeah. when you, you know, like this farm that I that, that I leased, you know, it's like I'm not going to go down there and shoot four-pointers and six-pointers. Right. I'm not even going to shoot year-and-a-half-old eight-pointers or even two-and-a-half-year-old eight-pointers. And if you... But that's that's my choice, right? right? That's my preference. But I know what is possible there, right. you know. So. But if you... Uh, if you go down there and shoot a 140 inch deer, you're probably not going to come back here and shoot a four pointer. Right. You know and what I've I mean? Done, I've done that a bunch of times. Right. I'd come back here and don't even haunt. Right. And also, and it's not that you don't want it. It's just the time. That's just the time thing. Cause if I could hunt every day, I would, but you know, it's time, but I, it's time management. And I want to make sure that I stack my odds in my favor. Every time I go in the woods, that's kind of like the goal. Like we, I was actually, I was kind of laughing to myself when we were talking about Maine a little bit. Um, because it's like, I, I kind of tell them tips. Like this is how I'd find a deer track if I was up there tracking. But I'm also that guy where it's like, I'll tell you how to hunt Maine without snow too. Pack yeah. up your bag and go home. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Know? Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause it's Some, usually yeah. up there. It's like either, yeah, it sucks. you either got snow or it's like super crunchy and you're just. Dude, it used to, you know, when you get the rainstorms and then it freezes at night. Oh my God. Yeah. That happened a lot. Oh my God! Or there's you, a lot of you know what is crazy about Maine though they have giant deer they really do some of the biggest in the country yeah and um a lot of guys are getting them with a bow nowadays which is awesome Southern Maine yep it's the houses it's the you you got to understand when you cut a house in you make prime edge habitat for whitetails yep you know that when like these these you know guys, what's you know what's they, interesting I forgot where I just heard this too I don't know who's it was like a a reel that came up on my on Facebook or something, but I was, they were talking about all these guys urban hunting, like Seek One and stuff, yeah. shooting imp super impressive deer, oh, like yeah. really, really sure, cool right. stories behind him and everything. But um, he's like, guys are kind of filtering towards these urban areas to hunt now yeah. because they have these deer. He said, why do they have these deer? Well, think about it. He said, the same reason that these urban, why were these big cities and urban areas built where they are? 
well, usually it's around a river system that has very lush soil yeah. that grows crops. Back in the day, people settled there because they could grow enough food to feed the people that were living there, right? Yeah. And it just gradually got bigger. Well, guess what? The bucks are eating that stuff too. The deer are eating that stuff. That's why they are growing that big around there. So the people that they're coming into these areas where people are living because they can eat yeah. and and eat well and survive well, a lot of times they have no pressure, right? So think about that, right? So, um, you know, same thing with Maine. They grow giant deer. Well, there's something in the soil, man. The, calcium belt. There's exactly. A, there's a calcium belt that runs you know, through parts of Maine. Same thing with Ohio, right? Yeah, no, the... Yeah, I mean, you're hitting the nail right on the head with, like, good soil regions produce massive deer. But, like, think about how destructive this forever wild is, right? Yeah. Because the thing about, like, this forever wild stuff, right, what would ha – like, th this is, like, the most um, – I'm trying to be politically correct, but – Controversial topic it is but like this forever wild right so let's say we're just gonna we're gonna leave the green mountain national forest untouched because we be we believe in forever wild wild nothing to do with us all right it dries out like right now and somebody throws a cigarette starts fire right we rush to put that shit out but back before there was any human to stop that fire and it was a lightning strike, these forests would burn down. Like, why do you think Kenora was so good? People wonder why Kenora was so good. Up in, it was all lands that burn from year to year to year. You'd have these massive burns, right? You, things would dry out and a lightning strike would cause these huge forest fires and it's reset. Bang, it resets. Like, nature resets itself. But when yeah. you surround yourself around a national forest and do everything to protect it, I mean, like putting out brush fires and everything else, like you're actually creating more of a problem than what your heart tells you forever wild should be. Well, and that's the thing. Like my... Maine, used to Maine used to burn. Oh, yeah. Maine used to burn. Well, like, you know, my dad goes out every year for yes. forest fires, right? Out west, Oregon, Washington, and all that. They never used to put those fires out. You want to know why they do now? Because people live out there now. Yeah, right. They have moved out there now. If nobody lived there, why what's the sense of spending they spend they spend billions of dollars, billions and billions and billions of dollars <laughs> on these fires. Yeah. You know? And trying to put them not, out. Not not to I'm gonna throw it out there, not to talk politics, but that was actually one thing Trump was super concerned about. You know, they're gonna try to cut down on all this government spending and stuff. Well, why don't you go out and clean out some of these forests, right? I mean, you've created that problem now because people live there, right? Yeah. So you, you can't just let people's houses burn to the ground right. now, right? I mean, that that sucks. But if that's going to be the case and people want to live in these areas that are prone to that happening, why aren't we going out and cleaning, at least cleaning up the deadfall stuff, at least trying, right? Or least, the stuff that's maxed out. Like, Yeah, I mean, we can send billions of dollars to, to Ukraine and Israel or whatever, but we can't f spend a few, like a couple billion, to go out with some dude, feller bunchers you, and clean this stuff up, dude. If you if you logged it, you'd be making yeah. millions and millions yeah. of dollars. Yeah. The resources. The, per the perfect there. example too is is right down the road from here, the, the channel yeah. where we grew oh, yeah. up on, beyond my, you know, beyond my dad's. <sighs> you know, I've spent a lot of time down there. Not seen a lot of deer. You want to know why? Because there's there's nothing for them down there. No, there, there's, there's really cedar nothing. Trees. There's cedar trees that you can't even... Too Man, there's... Yeah, there's pine, there's there. pine down there. You could build four houses out of on yeah. one tree. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and they just... It just is going to sit there and rot because somebody is, is doesn't want to see the tree cut down. Because they believe that that's its natural state when it wouldn't have been. Right. It wouldn't have been. Right. Forest, like... The you know the Great Plains and the well the the beautiful thing about it, like you just said Mother Nature resets itself well guess what you cut that that two hundred foot pine tree down that you can actually use to better somebody's life yeah and guess what's going to happen it's going to regenerate itself yes and you know what it's going to regenerate itself stuff that wild game likes to live in and and can survive on you know what I mean 
it's it's so pointless and it's it's not just down there it's everywhere in, in vermont specifically and actually we're gonna get a biologist on here yeah. we're not gonna grill him too hard but we're thinking in the spring we're gonna get him on here and, and kind of ask him some of these questions but why it just doesn't make sense you know because it, it is so funny it is so funny to me but like we 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 probably should wrap up the rut hunt because we're starting to get into more topics yeah. that we can we can cover whatever but it boils right down to like you know it's crazy because this whole forever wild system that we have here in vermont that's what keeps the deer numbers low so if if anybody's curious about like okay you know what can we do what what can we do to get better deer numbers i'm telling you right now it's a lost cause dave how many times did i drive up to every meeting in all stretches of oh, yeah. this state back when i had my driver's license and this all started came in at, you know coming out i was taking qdm pamphlets to the state biologist and they were laughing at me when i was handing it to them i was like hey you know you know like uh you're asking us what we can do like here have you seen this and they just like hand it back and laugh at me like i don't know buddy we we know what we're doing. And I always used to get mad. I always used to be like, you got to be kidding me. Like, what do you what do you mean you know what you're doing? I haven't seen a deer in 14 days, daylight till dark hunting in Vermont. I I haven't seen a deer all all fall break. Remember we used to get fall break? Oh, yeah. I spent a week in the woods and I haven't seen a deer. What do you mean you know what you're talking about? You're not, but you know what? They did. And it took me so long to realize that they did know what they were doing. And it, it was funny to me because, like, I was in a tree stand here in Vermont. It had to have been, like, November. It was the first time I think I I think I filmed the hunt, but I didn't, we didn't have anything to use from it. But I uh, I was sitting and I was like, this is the first time I've ever hunted because I, I didn't travel anywhere this year. I, I stuck around here. I did do a, a out-of-state thing for, like, four days, but um, wasn't too far from home. I didn't venture too far from home. But I was like... I think this is the first time I've I've hunted because I've always gone out west. This is the first time I've hunted since the rule change in Vermont. This is the first November bow hunt I've ever been on in Vermont. And I'm like, hey, this is pretty cool. And I'm sitting there and um, I was like, wow, what a great time to be in Vermont. I don't think I've ever hunted this time. I'm like, this is just a stellar time. I saw some deer. And I'm like, man, this is great. Well, then it was like a couple hours before dark maybe. Um, I started here. Oh, I, I say a couple hours. I was only out there a couple hours before dark, but like as we started getting to prime time, I started in the distance. I hear, and I was like, Oh, it's muzzleloader season. I completely forgot about it. I was like, It's muzzleloader season. I was like, Wow how did the state pull this wool over these hunters eyes you mean to tell me i'm sitting here with my bow and probably the best time to be a bow hunter in the state or just a hunter in general because we don't get this opportunity the first few days of november anymore like we never had that opportunity now we have it and i'm i'm hoping and waiting for the right doe to walk by me and probably the biggest buck on his feet is going to walk by me for a shot, right? This is what I've learned about, you know, hunting this time of year. And while I'm sitting here trying to accomplish that, we opened up a four-day season to go thump as many does as we can. How did people agree with that? He, they didn't. Here, they didn't agree with it. But people are out there with their money. And I know some guys aren't, but a lot no, of guys I, And I believe that because they took away the two-buck thing, they wanted people still a chance to kill Here's, just as many deer, right? Oh, they wanted to kill more because they took away one buck, but they added one Well, dozen. right, right. So so now you can shoot more doe, which is going to, in turn, knock down your numbers. If you harvest doe, you're going to knock down your numbers. Oh, yeah. Overall. Oh, yeah. So they were like, okay, well, two bucks, we'll, uh, we will go to one buck because people want to see better antlers. But in order to keep our numbers down, we'll add one doe. And then we're going to a four-day doe season when they're starting to, you know. Get bred, basically. Yeah. yeah. So it, it just, my, but hearing those shots was like, there's people out there participating in that. Like, this is my thought. Not to mention, there's another doe season. 
In December, they didn't. December, take, they didn't even they take, didn't it, take away. it away. Yeah, right. And that was all. The early season was the combat. People were complaining that people were shooting does that are bred. Well, they never took it away, but now they just opened up a season to shoot does, which is. It's just the time of year is mind boggling because how many guys were out muzzleloading and saw some good chasing action on their set and they have a muzzleloader and they can't shoot the buck. Here's my thought, right? And maybe we can talk to the biologist, but this is, this has been my thought for Vermont for a long time. And I don't really, I don't think I've ever put it on the record before, but here we go. I believe we ought to just statewide buck tag. If you want to do it with your, if you want to do it with your bow, do it with your bow. If you want to do it during early muzzleloader season, do it early muzzleloader season. You won't be out rifle hunting. If you want to do it during rifle season, do it rifle season. But let's get rid of this. I I can shoot a buck the same day that you can't shoot a buck because you choose a different weapon. Right. right. Let's get over that. that, that you know makes what that, no sense. that you do what that is? That's just selling tags. You know, the if I can sell a dough permit for this day, for this early muzzleloader season, you know, but you still have to buy an archery buck tag, you still have to buy a regular season buck tag, and you still gotta buy a muzzleloader buck tag. You're buying three buck just buy one. Just buy one like Kentucky does. Kentucky is the same exact rules as Vermont. They're they're seasonal. they're they're just trying I feel like they're trying to play the game because you know, they would they wouldn't make as much money. Yeah, how many well how many people but how many I do people, believe a resident Well, I don't know how how much How many no, people I'm though? Not. How many people do you think went to the store to buy their license? They bought a, bought an archery tag, a rifle tag, muzzle loader tag, shot their buck with their archery tag and paid for a rifle and a muzzle loader tag yeah. they can't use my dad does it every year he buys every tag yeah and i and i do it too you know and and that's that's kind of silly i guess you could just buy your bow wait, tag yeah wait. wait that's the, buy your bow tag and wait i wonder how many guys actually do that you know but i would because i <laughs> but the thing is a resident a resident you um, get your rifle tag you get your rifle tag. no you do but when you buy your hunt license you get a to, rifle tag to buy all of your tags to be able to shoot a buck in any in any season you want I think it's like a hundred dollars almost, isn't it? At, for a resident? Yeah. I don't know. I have a lifetime license. Yeah. I don't remember exactly. It's 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 fairly expensive. But like you said, if you just bought one tag, a and then if you and then tag. if you want to if you want to shoot a doe, this is what you do. Buy buy a doe tag, antlerless tag. Yeah. You know, for whatever bow or muzzleloader, but yeah, or rifle. Yeah. Why why just buy these statewide tags? And say, say okay, you can shoot. They're not chant. Let, let me get this straight. I, there's, I'm not going to beat a dead horse or even waste a bunch of hot air by saying this. They're not going to change the bag limit because that's what keeps the numbers as low as they are, right? And they have incentives in other places to do that. Like that's that's common knowledge. That should be common knowledge if you're a deer hunter in this state. But they, if if they did something more like, you know what, a statewide doe tag, statewide buck tag, you can use both those tags to turn rifle, right? And then uh, another, but just buy another archery doe tag and another archery muzzleloader or um, another muzzleloader doe tag. See what I'm saying? Your rifle tag comes with a doe and it comes with a buck. And then you can use that statewide buck tag in archery. And you can use that statewide buck and muzzleloader. Doesn't matter. Use a buck tag. Don't break it up into those seasons. But if you want to shoot another doe with your bow, you have to buy a bow antlerless tag. So that's basically how Ohio. Yeah, no, that's how every every other other state in the United States does it. We we are the probably the only ones. Like same with Maine, right? Maine, you kill your buck in archery, you're done. Yep. Right. I don't know of a single state out there actually that doesn't do it that way. Yeah. Honestly, that's how uh that's how Kentucky was. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's not the rut anymore. We're we're just going into another now we're podcast. rambling. Yeah. All right. So this is uh this is rut <laughs> the rut conversation leads to more always does. We were trying to keep them within 40 minutes. We're not doing that anymore. We're just 
the days that we can get down here and talk to your hunting, we will. But uh, what are your plans for the weekend? Yeah, I'm gonna grab grab my rifle in the morning. It's fun, uh, man. I'll probably uh, meet up with my dad and my nephew. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, I grabbed my rifle for the first time, and I pegged one out at 80 yards. I would not have got with my bow, and he piled right there. It was, I remember the rifle hunting is a lot of fun. That's it's a lot easier. It is a it is a lot easier, but a lot of fun nonetheless. Everybody, thank you for uh, tuning in one once again. Um, check us out on Instagram. We're going to be doing a little facelift um, for our other socials. Right now, a lot of this stuff is uh, under uh, a personal account. We're going to make it a business account. So you might see some of our old posts go away. Uh, we're going to start fresh. But uh, in the meantime, or be looking out for game seekers on instagram tiktok facebook and youtube we're not going to touch because that's doing pretty well yeah youtube's all good that, yeah. that'll all be up there in that video uh it's about a 10 minute video if you guys want to watch the whole thing it's pretty action-packed we, we we did not kill a deer um just a just a spoiler alert but um just the the fact was there wasn't one big enough that uh that i was ready to shoot but um yeah go on go on our uh that's going to be probably put up tomorrow or tonight and uh check that out there's a lot of good chasing on there that kind of coincides with what we've been talking about with this rock conversation tonight and um tell everybody you know about our podcast spread it around um you know we really appreciate you guys tuning in um we'll put a we're going to try to put a link um we're also working on youtube um, video for the podcast working on my game um, room and, a little bit and all that so it's um, easier for you guys I've, to find I've it. moved my game room now in my house a dozen times i think it found its final resting place but we're going to uh turn it into a little studio so we might put some of these there's a channel within our channel for podcasts that you can post some podcasts so we might start filming a couple of the podcasts but we want to uh we want to do that facelift first, just get it kind of comfortable in here to do them. Um, and uh, if you're going to be staring at our ugly mugs, you might as well have some deer in the background and stuff. So we'll work on that. Um, yeah, uh, just check out our social. I did put up a short, my Adirondack book from last week. I apologize. I did not bring a camera with me. I, I actually, sh I shot the deer and uh it's a long night whenever you kill one over there it's a really long night and i got home late and when i got home i had my gopro on the porch it got shipped to me so i was literally one day away from having a gopro that i could have captured that whole deal on but um i wasn't lugging a camera around i i kind of i lugged it around for a couple hunts there like davy did in ohio davy had a cameraman which is always nice i was trying to do some self-filming um not easy i i really tip my cap to the guys that do it and do it really well um but for that adirondack buck i did not get much content other than this podcast a couple pictures and a little short uh right after i shot him i took my phone out and did a little video but um so sorry about that but we're we're working on it we are slowly uh getting the equipment that we need that's going to help us um better capture our experiences because uh I, we we uh, run into them so we want to share that with everybody all right davy good good luck tomorrow i might sleep. all right till next time <laughs> yeah good luck yeah good luck to yep. all, uh, all our friends we'd be here all night good luck to all but all of our listeners good luck to all. and uh can't wait to see some stories if you have any luck, go ahead and post on some of our uh, socials, Facebook. Go ahead, post your pictures. We'd love to see them. We'd love to hear the story. Um, and if you guys got those questions, you know, we do. We have been getting a couple questions here. Um, just keep on sending questions because we're gonna start. We're gonna start saving them up so we can answer some of these questions that everybody has. So uh, it, there's a link on this podcast wherever you listen to the podcast you can send a message that way or you can just get a hold of us send us a message on on uh facebook instagram or however however else you uh get to us or 
got a question on YouTube, throw it on YouTube and we'll uh, air it here on the podcast. We're going to start doing some listener submitted questions. Alrighty guys. Um, keep on game seeking. Pretty exciting. Catch you later.